We have such a wonderful team here, and I can't uh, I can't thank the team enough for uh, being behind uh, all the all the really deep technology we've been building here. Um, those keynotes, so packed full of new things, I I'm sure you'll agree. Um, uh, there's just so much stuff. Uh, in my section, I talked mostly about risk, uh, about catastrophes and analytics at the individual uh, property level. Uh, for this session, we're going to step back. We're going to step way back to look at the field of earth observation. Cities evolving, climates changing, urban forests and national scale analysis. First, let's understand a little bit about why earth observation is important to you. It's this idea that we can stand back and uh, understand how the planet is changing, which is a lofty goal. But if you're in government or insurance, for example, uh, it's still relevant to you. In government, you're essentially doing uh, a mini version of Earth observation. Every time you take your part of the world, you want to understand the history of it, where things have been, uh, what things look like today, and how things have changed over time. Uh, insurance might be slightly less obvious, but uh, whenever they build uh, a, a risk model, for example, uh, what you need to do is, for each property scattered across a nation, you've got to figure out what that was like just before the event so you can learn to predict what it might be like afterwards with a high level of consistency. And these two different tasks of monitoring a local area or, or building risk models are both really a subset of Earth observation. Now we know what it is, let's have a bit of a think about what makes it really hard. First is the technology. There is some wonderful technology out there, constantly rolling out new camera systems, new satellites, things like synthetic aperture radar. It's all very, very exciting. But every time a new tech comes out, it starts uh, with a fresh history uh, rather than going back in time. So if you're trying to understand how the world has changed, uh, this creates big challenges with this, with this constantly evolving set of technologies. Secondly, uh, satellites themselves, uh, often the most high-res things they quote are, uh, are having to point to particular uh, parts of the world for military or other applications. Uh, so it's actually quite difficult to get a satellite program which um, gets a nice re regular repeatable Earth observation style data set. Aerial programs have historically been very bespoke. Uh, one customer in one place uh, pays for a data set and then another happens. Um, programs are starting to emerge, but they can chop and change and evolve. So if I ask you this question, uh, what data sets are out there for Earth observation uh, from the sky that have at least a decade of coverage uh, and at least annual repetition? I mean, there's Landsat, but there's not a lot else. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. You're stealing the punchline. Um, what about the analytics? We, we do all this work to regularly capture things with, it, with our satellites and our planes, and then we do analytics on a project basis. We say, I've got a project, I want to learn something, I'll label some imagery out of that project budget, I'll train a model, I'll execute that model, and then I'll walk away and do something else. And so the analytics isn't actually matching up with the consistency of the sensor data that gets captured. This is where I think uh, NIMAP AI has a wonderful role to play. Um, the historical catalogue spans 15 years in Australia uh, and eight years in the US and growing in New Zealand and Canada. Throughout that time, the consistency of the capture program is just absolutely incredible. I'm always blown away by how far you can drill back in time. And it still looks, uh, in some ways, you can get a similar thing. Uh, the team looking at seasonality and what time of day to capture and avoiding weather patterns. Uh, it's a big logistical challenge. And then with the resolution, even as we release our new camera systems that can do more things, we still have that consistent base product underlying it all of five to seven centimetre per pixel RGB imagery uh, that creates this underlying longitudinal data set. As for our AI, uh, we're doing it in what I believe is, is quite a unique way in the industry. Uh, rather than being project based, we're doing industrial scale AI to, uh, to meet the consistency of the capture program that we have. Um, we've got this big custom deep learning model. We've sunk huge amounts of effort into labeling uh, and getting a whole lot of different layers to work just right. And we run them on every survey that we fly. Now the teaser for this talk was that there's a geospatial time machine. And the trick here is that we can run our latest Gen 5 system on any historical imagery survey that we have because it just relies on five to seven centimeter RGB imagery. This is a little video from mid-2019 when we first launched our AI beta uh, capability. 
uh, that gives you a sense of where we thought we could head with Earth observation. still get a buzz from that video three years on. That was our Gen 1 data. It was all real data in the video too. Um, let's move on from the theory uh, to the practical. Uh, we'll now talk about the Australian National Tree Study that we've been publishing over the course of about a year uh, and, and you will have seen some blog posts and media about it as well. This is Marsden Park in Western Sydney. Uh, you can see our tree layer uh, in green and our building layer in orange. Um, if you uh, zoom in, it's even higher resolution than this. I'm just trying to show the whole suburb. Uh, that is Warunga um, on Sydney's North Shore. There's a slightly different mix of tree and building. Now imagine you have data like this at large scale and you want to understand it across a nation. What you need to do is simplify it. So if we take our imagery, we can overlay the Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, mesh blocks. Um, these are statistical units um, that can be linked to demographic data and we can calculate a percent tree cover or percent building cover in any one of these mesh blocks. We can throw away the, the non-residential mesh blocks, for example. For a lot of this analysis, we're interested in those heat island effects that Emma talked about uh, previously, um, where the, the effect is kind of within one or 200 metres of, of a house. So these are just the residential mesh blocks. We can summarise information at a suburb level. We can look at suburb level, just the residential cover or the total cover uh, of trees or buildings. And then we can do that for whole cities. We can do it for Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Perth. In fact, we can do it for 5,000 suburbs in Australia. Now this graph here is a graph that I would happily sit on for 20 minutes uh, just talking you through it. Um, but we won't, don't worry. Uh, so the dots each represent a suburb. The size of the dot is the population of that suburb. The colour of the dot represents which capital city it comes from. So red is Sydney, green is Melbourne, for example. On the vertical axis, you've got the percentage of total tree cover in that suburb. And on the horizontal axis, you've got the percentage of total building cover. You have right here an urban nation on a page. You can pull out insights like looking at that red edge along the top, from the top left to the bottom right, where you can see Sydney maintains really high tree cover despite increasing levels of building density compared to the other cities. Then you've got um, Perth kind of in the middle there in pink. Um, Melbourne is in the middle there too, but if you look in the bottom left corner, you see something really interesting. You see these big heavy suburbs in Melbourne with high populations, very low tree densities, but the building density isn't actually that high either. And so you can start to characterise how we're choosing to build nationally and think about it on a national level, but also dive onto individual suburbs. This is a simplified version of that graph. Um, if you say, what's the total percent of the population in Brisbane, say, that is living in a leafy suburb. And here we define a leafy suburb as one with at least 20% tree cover, which is shown to have some pretty good um, benefits for livability. We're going to jump into the time machine now. We're going to look at Adelaide, just one city, but over the course of 10 years. 
You can see 281 suburbs where we had data in both 2011 and 2021. We're focusing on residential tree cover for those heat island type effects. And we can see that the median suburb drops by about 9.8% relative uh, tree, residential tree cover. On the right, you can see the map. You can see the, the, the deeper pink suburbs are the ones that lost the most trees, and the greener suburbs are the ones that gained the most. You can look at the mesh blocks themselves and see patches of pink, patches of green, and then intermingled areas. There's all sorts of really interesting stories going on behind the scenes here. To really understand it, you have to look at individual suburbs. Each one of these graphs is a suburb. The green lines are showing the tree cover over 10 years. The orange lines are showing building cover over 10 years. Now, the biggest thing to note here is this is not just a before and after study. This is annual, seasonally matched tree cover data calculated from NearMap imagery using NearMap AI. You can see cases where the trees drop suddenly and then level out. They gain steadily. They drop steadily. The buildings change. There's a different story going on behind each suburb. These are just some of the suburbs where the change is the greatest. And if you really want to understand what's going on, you have to look at it one suburb as a, at a time. This first one uh, is a suburb called Northgate. It was fairly newly established in 2011. And you can see the green trees that were planted. We're going year by year here. Um, those green trees grow. Now, that may seem obvious, but it's pretty common for a new suburb to go in and the trees don't grow. They're either not looked after or they don't have enough soil. Um, but these trees are growing, and it's a wonderful heartwarming picture of what can happen over the course of a decade. Shortly, we'll see a before shot of 2011 and then an after shot of 2021. That's fantastic growth over that time, and it's a wonderful story to see. The second story is a little different. We're going to see Vale Park. It was already a mature suburb at the time uh, of capture in 2011. You'll see a lot of pink splotches. Those pink splotches are construction sites. A really common occurrence again and again in the suburb uh, is where a pink splotch replaces a building and a mature tree, and then two buildings pop up instead. This process is called urban infill. And if you look at the graph over time, there's just steadily increasing urban fill infill, uh, you can see the before shot there and the after shot there. That's one of the greatest losses for a suburb in Adelaide. And that's all stuff that's been seen before somewhat in, in blog posts and, and on the media. Here, for the first time, we're talking about the US tree canopy. We're taking it up an order of magnitude or a bit more. Uh, there's a lot of data here. Um, Australia was, uh, was really warming up for this. I showed these two cities here uh, to my seven-year-old son, and I said, which one have, has more trees? And he said, the one on the right, Daddy, of course. And our AI system agrees with him, at least from this picture. If we look at Charleston and zoom out, this is a humid subtropical riverside city. That's the population density according to the latest 2020 census, really clustered strongly along the riverbanks. If you look at the tree density, it's inverted. There's far fewer trees along the riverbanks and they're, they're in kind of the mountains around the edges. We'll come back to that. Uh, and that's a suburb of Charleston overall. In the US, they have census blocks at the low level, a bit like our mesh blocks, but they're a bit bigger. This is called the places data set. It's kind of cities and towns, so that's summary at the places level. We can then see Little Rock. This is also a humid, subtropical riverside city. But the population is much more evenly distributed away from the riverbanks. And so are the trees. The trees are much more evenly distributed as well. That's the summary at the, at the places level. Now, if you look at a two-year window um, to find the top, uh, the top tree cover and, and the data in that, you can do an analysis of 110 million or more building footprints. That's covering over 83% of the US population. In red here, we've shown all those vectorized building footprints rolled up to little tiny pixels showing the building density. And I teased you in the, uh, in the keynote what the number was. If we flip this to trees, you can see the number is that 52% of the US population is living in a leafy census block. Now, that one number if you think about the sheer amount of data going into that one number, as you trace it back down to the census block level, where there's four and a half million of them in the US, 
Then you trace that back to the vectorized outlines we have and right back to those pixels the size of a playing card that we capture from planes. It's just incredible how you can traverse up and down that analytical stack in order to do Earth observation. Think of the possibilities. This is just two of our 78 layers, uh, having a quick look at what's there. You can do things like look at the state capitals um, when you overlay them, it looks like that. Um, and I can show you a similar graph to what we showed before, instead of the suburbs in Australia, these are the places in the US. So in red we have the state capitals, uh, in blue we have the other cities and towns. Uh, you can see the very topmost largish red dot that's visible uh, is Rayleigh Durham with really high tree cover, and the bottom uh, really large uh, uh, red dot that you can see there is Phoenix, Arizona. It's amazing what's possible in terms of characterising a nation. We're going to go now back to Charleston and Little Rock. And you've probably been thinking why I chose those two. Uh, I didn't actually find out until after I'd chosen them that they were both humid subtropical cities. Um, they are in fact both leaders in tree cover for two different reasons. Charleston has a whopping 70% total tree cover uh, within, within the city limits. Little Rock has much lower, which doesn't look right with the picture, does it? Um, you've got 50% total tree cover in Little Rock. However, the way the population and the trees are distributed mean that 88% of the population in Little Rock is living in a leafy census block, compared to only 68% in Charleston. And the, the makeup of the city is not just how many trees and how many buildings there are, but it's about how they're mixed together. Uh, as we move back to our premise originally of NearMap AI for Earth observation, uh, you can see that we're just at the beginning of this journey. Uh, we, we seek to do immense good with this data. So if you're an academic and you think that this could change your field, uh, we'd love to chat. We're already working with some academics. Um, if you're not, if you're in local government, for example, um, I challenge you to think about your data in a different way. Uh, your NearMap AI data set is not just a data set in isolation for you to use. Uh, it's a data set in context of other data sets all around the country and indeed on the other side of the planet. As you make changes to policy, as you test uh, what's been implemented um, and see what the impact of that is, uh, assessing those changes, uh, it can help you learn to better manage your region uh, for the sake of your community. I'd like to imagine a world where insurers, property developers, renewable energy startups, local governments and environmental activists are all using the same source data to understand the world from their perspective. Uh, that's already taking place today with our current set of NearMap AI customers. Uh, and it's a world I'd love you guys all to be part of. If we can move beyond discussions around methodology and which data set we used and where it's available and instead focus on what the data actually means, we can all move on towards building a better world, a more livable world. And that's a world I want to be part of. Thanks for your time.